Uh, a lot of people think that in order to keep their glucose level steady, they have to go keto and never eat carbs ever again. And that um, that's the only solution. It really isn't. You can still eat starches and sugars in a way that leads to a smaller glucose spike. So let me give you an example with another hack. So this study found that if you eat the constituents of a meal in a specific order, you can reduce the glucose spike of that meal by up to 75%. That's a lot. Meaning, yes, meaning you can eat the exact same meal, same quantity, same foods. Just by switching the order, you get a smaller spike. And you guessed it, the best thing to eat first is the vegetables, as I mentioned earlier, because you take advantage of the fiber. And then when you put the starches and sugars at the end of the meal, you get a much smaller spike than if you have them earlier on in the meal. This episode is brought to you by Maui Nui Venison. I found Maui Nui Venison because I'm always looking for snacks for myself and my kids, and Maui Nui Venison delivers. They have in each jerky stick, which by the way, tastes amazing. You can get it in peppered or original, has about 60 calories and 10 grams of protein. You can have two, you double up, it makes a great snack for you, for your kids, for your family members, for your guests. And they use wild harvest methods that matters because it is better for the environment. Basically, they have a mission and a story to bring the best venison to you, no matter where you live, while being good to the environment. You can try yours. Go to Maui Nui Venison. That's M A U I N U I Venison, V E N I S O N dot com slash lion. Take advantage of this limited time offer and get 20% off your first order. Jesse Inchowski, welcome to the podcast. I see that you're wearing a, a Thank muscle tee. Thank you so tea. much for having me. Yes, I wore my muscle tee for you to show off my guns because I've been lifting weights three times a week. So I felt like this was the perfect opportunity to show them. Um, off. <laughs> I would absolutely agree. And thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. You are a French biochemist, incredible, mm -hmm. New York Times bestselling author. You have been on a mission to translate blood sugar, science, glucose regulation to the public. And by the way, that is not an easy task to take science and make it understandable to the general population. True, true. It is my passion. And uh, it's been great to be able to, to make a career out of it. Well, first of all, how did you become the glucose goddess? I mean, it could have been the protein goddess. It could have been the fatty acid goddess. But you chose the glucose goddess. Yeah. Well, it, it feels more like it chose me. So I started my health journey when I was a teenager. I had an accident when I was 19 years old and I broke my back jumping off a waterfall. And that propulsed me into a world of physical pain, mental health issues. My body felt broken. My brain didn't feel like mine anymore. I was thrown into the deep end of uh, health struggles. And it's at that point that I realized at that young age that if you don't ha have your health, you really don't have that much. And so I was forced in a way to go on this journey to try to get my health back, to try to understand my body, my brain, how to, how to fix myself. And that brought me to want to study biochemistry in grad school, study uh, in Silicon Valley and work in genetics. And nothing really helped me until I discovered the fabulous land of glucose levels. Um, I had the opportunity to wear a glucose monitor as part of a research study when I was in Silicon Valley. Very randomly, I don't have diabetes. Nobody in my family has diabetes. I didn't think it would really bring that much to my life, but I was curious about it. Turns out that it completely changed the game for me. It showed me that the days during which my glucose levels were steady, my mental health was good. And the days where my glucose levels were going spike, drop, spike, drop, spike, drop, all those symptoms, all those mental health issues I had been struggling with, well, they would flare up and get worse. And so to me, Gabrielle, I felt like this was the first clue 
that I had finally gotten to try to fix my mental health and my body, my brain. And so I became fascinated by the topic. I found that I wasn't alone, that up to 80% of the population who does not have diabetes can still experience these glucose spikes on a daily basis, and that they can lead to lots of stuff from cravings to fatigue to hormonal imbalances to long-term diabetes. And so I went on a quest to learn how to study my glucose levels in a way that was not too cumbersome, and that helped me heal myself. And then I wanted to share it with the world. And that's how the Glucose Goddess account started and ha- how this whole journey of uh, teaching people the science of blood sugar got started. And it was totally unexpected for you, yes? Yes. Yes, absolutely. When you were dealing with challenges of blood sugar regulation, what were some of the moods, swings that you were feeling, or if they were swings, or if it was anxiety, what kind of internal feelings were you having? For me, it was more depression, anxiety, panic attacks that had started after my accident. And that got worse. And I had these sort of flare-ups once in a while. I also experienced what's called depersonalization, which just honestly feels like inflammation of the brain. And I didn't really understand why some days my mental health was better or worse than others. And it's when I figured out that there was a glucose connection that I found one of the first variables that could explain why some days my mental health was worse. So yeah, it was mostly anxiety, depression, and this very strange depersonalization symptom. Have you heard of it? I have. I have, actually. Yeah. We we actually see it a lot in our clinic when individuals are exposed to mold. When they have environmental really? toxins. Yeah. Um it depends on where their location is. We we certainly see it. So let's start with the foundation. The foundational question I'm sure everybody asks you is what is glucose? Why is it important and how is it or can be harmful to people? So glucose is your body's preferred source of energy. Okay. So every single cell in your body, from your brain cells to your muscle cells to your liver cells, use glucose for energy. And as human beings, the main way that we provide this very important molecule to our body is by eating foods, specifically by eating two types of foods. So starches and sugars. Yes, protein can also lead to some glucose, but generally for most of the population, they get glucose from starches and sugars. And some glucose is fine, right? No problem. It's like when you have a plant at home and you know the plant needs some water to live, but if you give the plant too much water, then it drowns. Well, the human body is similar in the sense that some glucose, totally perfectly okay, too much glucose and problems start happening. And specifically, when during a meal, you eat too many of these starches and sugars, your body will experience what's called a glucose spike. So simply put, it just means a rapid increase in how much glucose is in your bloodstream and in your body. And these spikes are really what I've focused my research on. These spikes lead to a few consequences. They lead to inflammation, they lead to glycation, and they lead to insulin release. So the objective for us to feel better is to try to keep these spikes a bit more under control and steady our blood sugar levels. And there's so many really cool hacks and techniques we can use. A lot of them involve using our muscles, which of course you are a total pro at, but there are simple things we can do and that have a fundamental impact on the health of our body and our brain, short-term today, how we feel, and also long-term. And that's really the message I want to bring to people is that it's easy and it's going to help you today and in the future. And I think that there is some, there's just some real benefit to understanding what foods and how much that can cause uh, this spike in glucose. And of course, when we think about a glucose spike, the body has a normal natural response to foods. Typically, at least in my clinic and I think in the literature, individuals, you do not want to go above 140 milligrams per deciliter. However, up until that point is somewhat normal. My question would be, how is blood glucose measured? And at what point do you feel that it becomes harmful? Mm. 
Well, most of us only get our glucose levels measured once a year. We get our fasting glucose levels measured. And a traditional doctor will say, oh, if your fasting glucose is underneath 100 milligrams per deciliter, you don't have prediabetes, you're perfectly healthy, see you next year. If your fasting glucose comes back somewhere between 100 and 126, your doctor will say, oh, whoa, you have prediabetes. And anything above 126 will be diagnosed as type 2 diabetes. Now, the problem is, once you get to the prediabetes diagnosis, your glucose levels have been rising for many, 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 many years. And so even if you don't yet have prediabetes or type 2 diabetes, it's super important to look at your glucose levels and make sure they don't creep anywhere near that 100 mark. So to your question of when does it become harmful, I mean, so clinically we can say it becomes harmful the closer you get to prediabetes. But on your point about the glucose spikes, yes, we should avoid increasing our glucose levels post 140 after a meal, right? But there are even some studies that say that any increase after eating of more than 30 milligrams per deciliter, so a delta, an increase of more than 30 milligrams per deciliter, should be avoided in healthy individuals. So if your fasting glucose level is 90, you should avoid going above 120 after eating. And this is debatable, of course, right? And I don't focus so much on the absolute numbers. I focus more on helping people reduce and flatten their spikes regardless of the height of the spike, whether they're at plus 30 or plus 60 after a meal, we can all benefit from reducing that. So in conclusion, if you have prediabetes or type 2 diabetes, you need to flatten your glucose spikes to put those conditions into remission. And if you don't have prediabetes yet, you also need to look at your glucose spikes to prevent the onset of prediabetes and also to help you not get all the symptoms from the glucose spikes in the first place, which can be as simple as chronic fatigue, as cravings, as poor sleep, as hormonal disruptions, etc. So anybody benefits from learning about this topic. I, I do think that there is a lot of benefit from learning about it. And you know, it's interesting when you think about blood sugar regulation, one thing, and I'm curious is if you see this, so do you always wear a continuous glucose monitor? This episode is brought to you by Thesis. Thesis is the world's first customized nootropic company. Nootropics are nutrients found in nature or the human body that enhance things that we care about like focus, energy, mood, dare I say, logic. And what I love about this company is while most companies take a one-size-fits-all approach, Thesis takes a customized approach. You can go to their website, you can take their quiz, and it has databases after databases of information that will allow them to pair you with your perfect blend. You'll get a starter kit with four different blend recommendations. I have to tell you, lately, I have been all about Logic. Logic has something called Bacopa in it. Bacopa is one of the most studied nootropics. It's good for memory, neuroprotection, learning, many things. You can try different blends by going to takethesis.com slash Dr. Lion. That's takethesis.com slash Dr. Lion. Thesis is offering 10% off your first box. You'll get a customized starter kit. You'll take the quiz, use the code, and you are well on your way. No, you know, I did for the first two years nonstop, and now I do it once every six months because I know everything now. I can, I can intuit everything that's going on. It's amazing. On. It, it truly is amazing. And I will say for people that are just exploring putting a continuous glucose monitor on, one thing that we see, and I'm curious is if you saw this, individuals on a higher protein diet will maintain higher levels of blood sugar, roughly anywhere from maybe nine, you know, in the 90s. And it's through gluconeogenesis. Let's say their carbohydrates mm -hmm. are controlled, their body becomes very good at making glucose and much less reliant on external carbohydrates like skinnels or whatever. Absolutely. And you can prove this to yourself by putting a continuous glucose monitor on. And I think Jesse makes a really good point is you have to understand your own body. There are certain variabilities for everybody. I have a question for you. Did you notice that when you went above a certain amount of carbohydrates that you got a robust response regardless of the food type? Or was it very dependent on the food type and the fiber content? 
You know, I never measured grams of carbs. That's just, my brain doesn't work that way. I'm, I'm much more of an abstract person when it comes to food. I'm like, oh, you know, 40% of my meal is protein and 20% is fiber and the rest is carbs. So I couldn't, I could not tell you the amount of carbs, uh, but very clearly, you know, the breakfast that I used to eat, which was a Nutella crepe and orange that juice. That sounds I mean, good. That's pure. Minus orange juice. Sounds good, right? <laughs> my husband had that last week. <laughs> like, what are you bringing really? in the house here, honey? I mean, I was raised on that, right? And then at 11 in the morning, I felt awful, hungry, exhausted, but I just thought that was normal. So to me, what I like to teach people is just to be able to be a food detective and to be able to discern what kind of macronutrient is in front of them before they get into counting the number of grams. So for example, I want everybody to know that when they look at bread, well, that's starch. Or when they look at chicken, that's protein. When they look at vegetable, that's going to be fiber. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm, it's kind of a sweeping analysis of the food composition, but I think it's so important to be able to do that. And most people don't have that skill yet. So if you're just eating starches or sugars and sugars are anything that tastes sweet from, you know, a banana to a chocolate cake, essentially, and starches being bread, rice, pasta, potatoes, etc. Those are the things to look out for because those are the things that turn to glucose when you digest them. So anytime you have a meal that is mostly just starch and sugar, you can be pretty sure you're going to get a massive glucose spike. And that's that's the first place to start really. Yeah, and you know, it's it's really interesting from what we teach people, anything above first of all, number 1, people do not typically count macronutrients. It is very challenging. Yeah. Just in general, it seems as if people are very busy, but anything above 50 grams of carbohydrates seems to have a much more robust insulin spike. So the blood glucose rises, then insulin increases, and you potentially can get a, subse a subsequent drop in blood sugar, which makes you all the things that Jesse was discussing, whether it's irritable, tired, mood swings, fatigue, really important. Do you think that there are actionable things that individuals can do to manage the glucose spike, these, what you call these hacks that are important to- Yeah, that was a candid question. It was like, of course. Yeah, so for those so listening, many. I have a great team that helps me and we go through all the content of the individual that we invite on the show and we send them a list of questions prior and we send them some studies, et cetera. So yes, many hacks. And I'm really all about action. And there's theory and we can talk about disease states all night long, but I want to help people actually get started. That's my passion. It's behavior change. So uh, in my book, my first book, Glucose Revolution, there are 10 hacks, but I want to cover maybe the four most important ones here today, at least these four, because if you apply these four hacks, you will significantly reduce your blood sugar swings, your glucose spikes, and start reaping the benefits immediately. So the first most important hack to avoid glucose spikes is all about breakfast. And it can be breakfast at 9 a.m., it can be breakfast at 4 p.m., you can fast for as long or as little as you want, but the first meal of your day should always be savory, never sweet right? Most of us have a sweet first meal of the day. Like I mentioned, the Nutella crepes and orange juice, or it can be the breakfast cereal or the toast and the jam, etc. When you have something sweet in the morning, that leads to a massive glucose spike and then a crash. And then your whole day ends up being this glucose roller coaster where you feel exhausted, cranky, moody, and you have cravings for sugar. And then it's 11 p.m. and you've eaten five pots of ice cream. You know, we all know how those days go. Because your breakfast determines your glucose levels for the rest of the day. So have a savory breakfast first thing in and the morning. And what would be some examples, whenever you're Jesse, of your favorite so, savory breakfast? So a savory breakfast is always built around protein. So my favorite savory breakfast would be an omelet with feta and tomatoes, maybe like some tuna, hummus, avocado situation. And my favorite savory breakfast is actually leftovers from dinner. Super easy warm them up in a pan, crack some eggs in there, throw some Parmesan on top, and you're good, right? We should be treating breakfast like we treat our other meals. The concept that breakfast food should be de dessert is an invention of the food industry. We don't need that. It's only harming us. 
So savory first meal of the day built around lots of protein. That's going to keep your glucose levels nice and steady. Do you ever think about resistant starch when you're having the breakfast? Can you mention about that as yeah. a strategy? Absolutely. You can have resistant starch. You can have, you can even add, you know, some vegetables in there to just get the fiber. And if you want to have a simple piece of bread, for example, or some potatoes, which is just regular starch, you can, but it should be there for taste, right? It should never be the center of your breakfast. It should be there for pleasure, for taste, but not as the main character. And something cool about resistant starch while we're on the topic, uh, there's some really cool studies that show that when you heat starch up and then you cool it down overnight or in the fridge, some of the starch in the food, let's say in some pasta, will turn into resistant starch. So you're essentially lowering the glucose impact of a starch by heating it up and cooling it down and then eating it later on. That's so amazing. And do you see that? Do you see that in your own body? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And so what I do is I find these studies that are really interesting and then I test them on my own glucose levels to produce sort of an illustration of those scientific studies uh, so that people can get the message from the studies in a very visual, easy way. That's the goal. Which you do a wonderful job at doing that. And just for the listener, the resistant starch, these are molecules that do exactly that. They resist digestion and they function kind of like a fiber. That yeah. That's one way you can think about it as opposed to just straight white bread, et cetera. It becomes more fiber-esque exactly. in the body. And it acts like fiber. So you can end up with some pasta that has way more fiber than it originally would have if you had just eaten it straight there. But that's like a little side quest hack, right? We don't have to do that for every single <laughs> starch that we eat. Um, so that was the first one, savory breakfast. The second one, which is very important, has to do with vegetables. So when we eat vegetables at the beginning of a meal, and this is key, at the beginning of a meal, the fiber in the vegetables has time to go and coat the walls of our upper intestine, creating a protective mesh in our upper intestine that stays in place for a few hours. And this mesh helps reduce how quickly glucose molecules from the rest of the meal are going to make their way into your bloodstream. So you're slowing down the arrival of glucose molecules into your blood by having what I call a veggie starter. So before lunch or before dinner, start your meal with a plate of vegetables. It can be Anything from roasted broccoli with tahini to some raw carrots to salad, to whatever you want. A veggie starter. Take advantage of that fiber in your veggies to reduce the spike of the rest of the meal. And after the veggie starter, eat whatever you want, right? You just add this plate. And it's interesting because in so many cultures, we see this as a habit. So in France, where I'm from, we have this concept of crudité, which is kind of like an old school thing our grandparents used to do, which is raw veggies at the beginning of a meal. In Italy, antipasti is usually built around vegetables. So we've known for a long time that these habits make a lot of sense. And only recently do we have the science and the glucose evidence to back it all up. It's really cool. I actually, I hadn't thought about that. That's, abs that's absolutely yeah. correct. Does it matter what kind of fiber, whether it's soluble, insoluble, do you care or do you just say, Listen, friends. I don't care. I mean, this is this is my philosophy, right? I'm just like any veggies. Just find veggies that you want, even if it's just salad that actually doesn't have that much fiber in it. But even if you just want a little bit of salad or if you want to go, you know, the full nine yards and make a beautiful roasted dish of lots of different veggies, go for the veggies. That's the most important part. And so the first hack is eat a savory breakfast with protein. The second hack yeah. is to pre-game your meal with fiber was the third. Exactly. Thank you to Element for sponsoring this episode of the show. Element, spelled L-M-N-T, is an electrolyte pack that I've been using for a long time now. I'm a huge fan, which is why I'm thrilled that they are sponsoring this episode of the show. Element is formulated to help anybody and everybody with their electrolyte needs, whether you know you need it or not. For example, if you are training and sweating a lot, if you are not getting enough sodium or potassium or magnesium in your diet, this has you covered. It's a science-backed electrolyte ratio. It doesn't have any junk in it. It doesn't have any sugar. Comes in very easy travel packs. You can throw in your bag. 
I drink between two and three a day. They help me with muscle cramping. It helps me maintain my hydration. Tastes amazing. Right now, Element is offering my listeners a free sample pack with any purchase. That's eight single serving packets free with any Element order. Get yours at drinklmnt.com slash Dr. Lion. That's drinklmnt.com slash Dr. Lion. You can try it totally risk-free. If you don't like it, you can give it to someone and they will give you your money back. No questions asked. Okay. The third one has to do with vinegar. And I spent most of my time reading scientific studies. And when I first came across the scientific studies on vinegar and glucose levels, I almost fell off my chair. When was that? When did you? I could not believe it. It was about four or five years ago. And I really couldn't believe it. Um, So it turns out that vinegar contains a molecule called acetic acid. And when we have a tablespoon of vinegar in some water before eating carbs, this can reduce the glucose spike of our carbs by up to 30% just by adding this vinegar drink before eating them. And the reason for this is because acetic acid slows down the enzymes in charge of breaking down carbs into glucose molecules. So the acetic acid slows down how quickly the glucose from the carbs arrives into your bloodstream. Once again, it's all about velocity, right? And slowing down that glucose so it doesn't spike so high. And again, Gabri, like, Everybody has vinegar in their kitchen. It is an ingredient that's been around for centuries. And in the Middle East, in Iran, for example, they have apple cider vinegar every single day. It's known to be a health ingredient, but only recently have we started to uncover what's really going on on a chemical level. So these are not rocket science. They're kind of common sense, but actually we need to bring them back because we've lost touch with all of them. That that advice is really valuable in terms of what do we know from a foundational perspective and what have people always done and what have we gotten away from? I pulled a a meta-analysis here and this is the effects of apple cider vinegar on lipid profiles and glycemic parameters, a systematic review and meta-analysis of randomized clinical trials. I will link it here for you guys. And the conclusion was that they found a significant favorable effect of apple cider vinegar consumption on fasting plasma glucose and blood lipid levels. Absolutely. And what's also cool is that it doesn't matter whether it's apple cider vinegar or any other type of vinegar, because they all contain acetic acid. So, you know, apple cider vinegar is sort of the trendy one, but it can be white wine vinegar, it can be cherry vinegar, it can be rice vinegar. They all contain this acetic acid molecule. You do want to avoid, though, the very syrupy balsamic glaze, the stuff that, you know, pours really slowly out of the bottle, because that's full of sugar, so that's not going to help at all. And how does exercise play a role in all this? Ooh, I'm excited to talk about this with you. Well, this is the fourth hack. The fourth, the fourth most important hack is to recruit our muscles in our fight against glucose spikes. So the advice that I give people is after eating, move your body for 10 minutes, okay? Because as I mentioned at the beginning of this episode, every single cell in your body uses glucose for energy and your muscle cells also use glucose for energy. And so we can use this to our advantage. If we contract our muscles after eating, some of the glucose from the meal will be used by our muscles instead of hanging around and creating a big glucose spike. So even just 10 minutes of walking, even just cleaning your apartment, walking your dog, doing the dishes, you can go to the gym as well, but any kind of movement within 90 minutes after the end of a meal is going to significantly reduce the glucose spike of that meal. Now, of course, the other piece to look at is how much muscle mass do you have in the first place? Because the more muscle mass you have in your body, the more you're going to have these incredible storage units to store any excess glucose. And you're the pro at this. So I will let you take the mic. Um, Well, yes, uh, glucose is the site for, uh, skeletal muscle is the site for glucose disposal. And what's so amazing is it doesn't require insulin. When you have exercising skeletal muscle, the body will pull the blood, the glucose that is in the bloodstream out of the bloodstream and move it to skeletal muscle. So I, lo- I think the fourth hack is my favorite. I think that that fourth hack should be hack number one, 
<laughs> and, and I will also mention that when you engage in physical activity, so what Jesse is talking about is she's very specifically speaking about post-feeding glucose response. When you exercise and or when you are stressed, you will see increases in blood glucose. That is not, from my understanding, Jesse, that is not what you were talking about. You are purely talking about when you eat something, what happens? Yes, correct. Correct, correct. So I'm talking about using our muscles and movement as a way to dispose of glucose after eating so that you reduce the glucose spike of the meal that you just had, so that you eat the meal that you like with fewer consequences on your health by recruiting your muscles to dispose of some of that excess glucose. Do you have thoughts over time if this ends up being meaningful outcomes? For example, let's say someone like myself, I'm tiny, maybe my blood sugar never goes up past 140. Do you think that there is benefit to measuring it, watching it? I don't recommend everybody wears a glucose monitor if that's the the question you're asking. Um, I used to. I used to think everybody should wear one and it was going to be life changing. And I realized over the years and by getting a lot of feedback from my readers that for some people, having a glucose monitor and seeing those numbers all day can be quite stressful. And also, if you don't have the education, it can be very confusing to interpret. Seriously, even I sometimes I'm like, I have no idea why this pattern is happening, right? So I would recommend people actually sort of try to check in with themselves, think about their cravings, their energy levels, um, their hormonal health, their sleep, how they feel their skin as a way to assess how their glucose is doing within. But if you're listening to this and you feel really drawn to trying a glucose monitor, go for it. Just be aware that you need as much information as possible. For example, my first book, which is, it's not a plug, seriously, it's just a really good well, we'll put in the show notes. <laughs> glucose Bible. Yeah, glucose Bible to have if you want to go down this route. But I think a lot of people can get the benefits of these hacks without wearing a glucose monitor. Is there anything? So do we have any more hacks? So that was four. Well, we have tons of hacks, but those are the four most important ones that I really want people to take away. You can find the other ones in my book, but savory breakfast, veggie starter, vinegar, moving after eating, those that's the pillar. If you do that for four weeks, you will get significant benefits. Has there been anything that is surprising that has come out in the literature as you were reading? Yeah. Tell me. A lot of really interesting, surprising stuff. The, the most recent study that really blew my mind is the effect of grounding on your glucose levels. So grounding being the act of either putting your feet against the earth, right? Or in, in some grass or something. So essentially connecting your electrical voltage with the voltage of the earth. And as this happens, inflammation goes down, you sort of equilibrate your voltage in your body, electrons get put into the earth. And the researchers also found that this significantly lowers your glucose levels. They don't really they know why. Cortisol? But they Yes, it decreases cortisol. Yes, and inflammation in the body. So it's probably all connected. But again, this just tells me, wow, we all wear these shoes that completely insulate us from the earth. We're just walking on concrete all day. If we came, if we just went back a little bit and walked on the bare earth a bit more, our glucose levels would benefit. So again, it's coming back to these very common sense things. But I thought it was amazing to see a study on it. I'll send it to you. Um, anything else, anything else that just surprised you and shocked you? I mean, that is pretty surprising that the environment would play a role like that. Yeah. Another cool study. I mean, there's so much stuff. I will mention one that I love, which has to do with married couples. So these incredible researchers, very brave researchers, recruited a bunch of married couples, I think about 100 married couples, and they gave each person in the couple a voodoo doll representing their spouse. And the researchers asked the participants to put a pin in the voodoo doll every time their partner irritated them. And this for six weeks, okay? Then the researchers got the voodoo dolls back and measured the participants' glucose levels. Now, what they found is that the people who had the most glucose lows Okay, so essentially more variable glucose levels with more hypos had put more pins in the voodoo doll representing their spouse. 
So the researchers concluded that your glucose levels could maybe have a link to how you show up in relationship, how irritated you are by those around you. And to me, this is so important because it's telling us that the way we eat can change who we are as a person. It can change almost our personality, right? So if you're having marital troubles or even just feeling difficult emotions, maybe looking at how you're eating could help you get to a place where you feel more balanced and at peace. And for me, that study, I just have, you know, big kudos to the researcher. I just think it's such a funny study, right? Uh, it's, it's amazing. Yeah. What do you think about that? Comparing uh, voodoo dolls. I mean, how many pins did you put in there? Do you think that the environment, so for example, this, this group that had the voodoo dolls, I'm going to get my husband one. It's going to be full of pins and it's just going to be a whole thing. Do you think that the interpersonal dynamic also can affect blood sugar in which that would then change the way that we, maybe some people have a higher glucose tolerance than others. Maybe some people that appear metabolically healthy don't need as many carbs just because of the high stress environment. Have you, if you thought about that? Absolutely. Yes. I think it's interesting. It's sort of looking at it the other way around. So the biggest glucose spike I ever saw in myself was from stress. I gave a big presentation five years ago. I was terrified. And then I, in front of a bunch of hundreds of people, and then I look at my glucose levels and I had spiked to 190 just from giving a presentation in front of people, just from stress. And so if we follow that logic, big glucose spike from the stress, then big glucose drop consequences, crankiness, moodiness, cravings, et cetera. I hadn't eaten anything, but just my environment, the fact that I was in a stressful situation impacted my glucose and my behavior, my personality for the rest of the day made me more likely to seek out sweet foods that would then keep me on a glucose roller coaster. So for sure, you can imagine that somebody who lives in a more stressful environment will have bigger glucose spikes and drops due to that environment. And then that would only be exacerbated and get worse because that then leads to you, you know, having behaviors that are just going to make it a vicious cycle and worse and worse and worse. So it's a very multifaceted, uh, complicated, convoluted relationship. Have you, have you heard of this, something called glucotypes? patterns? Glucotypes. Is, are you talking about the Stanford study? Glucotypes reveal new patterns of yes, glucose dysregulation. Exactly right. In 2018. Yes. yes, exactly. This is a this is a very important study. That is the study that showed us that up to 80% of people who do not have diabetes can still have spikes into the pre-diabetic or diabetic range from foods like breakfast cereal. That was a study that changed the game. That was one of the first studies using glucose monitors on that population and sort of ringing the alarm bell saying, hey, everybody, turns out even if you are metabolically quote unquote healthy and you don't have prediabetes, you can still have these big spikes that have an impact on your health. Yeah, it's, it's really well laid out. It shows low variability, moderate variability, and severe variability with individuals that again, as Jesse, you were saying, um, are not necessarily diabetic. And then these glucotypes were associated by these variability patterns. Thank you to Inside Tracker for sponsoring this episode of the show. Again, blood work is of critical importance. It is the beginning to your journey to health and optimization. And by the way, health optimization is an active and dynamic process you should be involved in. I strongly suggest that you go to insidetracker.com slash Dr. Lion. They are offering 20% off their entire Inside Tracker store. And if you are new to blood work, you can head over and grab Inner Age 2.0, which is amazing. It looks at 17 different biomarkers for men and 13 for women to allow you to calculate your biological age aka your inner age, to see where you're at and what you need to improve. It is a low cost to entry. And depending on your area, you can have a mobile phlebotomist come and take your blood, which by the way, is such a luxury and it eliminates all excuses. For a limited time only, you can get 20% off the entire Inside Tracker store. Just go to insidetracker.com slash Dr. Lion. That's insidetracker.com slash Dr. Lion and figure out 
where you are to determine where you are going. Yes. What are your thoughts on the gut microbiome? Where do you think that that plays a role in blood sugar regulation? Or is it still too early to to tell? You know, I'm not an expert on the microbiome, but what's very clear is that, you know, your microbiome is what processes your food. And we know that a healthy microbiome keeps your glucose levels more steady and an unhealthy microbiome leads to more glucose spikes. So it's all connected. It's all connected. You would have to get a gut expert on on here to to discuss that. But um, if you eat in a way that is going to cause glucose spikes, you're also eating in a way that is going to make your microbiome unhealthy. So going to promote the growth of, you know, quote unquote, bad bacteria. And that ends up being a vicious cycle because then for the same foods, you will get a bigger glucose spike because your microbiome is less healthy. So interesting. Isn't that interesting? And that is really this personalized medicine. And what Jesse is saying is that we could eat, you know, my producer over here, Matt, who's sitting over my left shoulder, he could eat, we, I don't know, we were filming something on Don't Cringe Jesse, Rice Krispie Treats. He could eat rice, they actually are protein rice, rice Krispie Treats, but he could eat that and his blood sugar could go to 150, maybe, probably not, he's pretty fit. And mine could, the exact same thing, exact same meal, maybe pretend we're the digital twin of each other. And mine could only go to 110 and maybe or 120. Maybe it's because of, I mean, there's many different reasons as to why that would be, but gut microbiome, I think, does play a bigger role than we have yet to recognize. It it could be gut microbiome, it could be insulin release right? So glucose is really not a very complete picture. It could also be a hydration status. So when you're more dehydrated, you have bigger glucose spikes. It can be muscle mass. It can be time of your menstrual cycle. It could be stress. It can be uh, how tired you are. I mean, the, the variables are endless, but, and that's why it's so difficult to compare two people's, two people's glucose spikes and draw any conclusions. We can't really say much because it depends on so much stuff. But what we can say is that if both you and your producer had used one of my hacks before eating the Rice Krispie Treat, both of your spikes would have been proportionally smaller. And that's the key, right? Because those hacks work in everybody, regardless of how high you're actually spiking. Acetic acid will work for an individual no matter what. Yeah. That's amazing. Now I know why my dad just slams apple cider vinegar. He, he lives in Ecuador. Yes, he lives in Ecuador. And before he gets here, he needs to make sure that there is a bottle of apple cider vinegar in the house. Wow. That's amazing. See, ancestral wisdom. They know much better than we do. It's amazing. Uh, he listens to the podcast. What are some of the most common misconceptions people have with managing blood sugar that you've seen? Hmm. Uh, A lot of people think that in order to keep their glucose level steady, they have to go keto and never eat carbs ever again. And that um, that's the only solution. It really isn't. You can still eat starches and sugars in a way that leads to a smaller glucose spike. So let me give you an example with another hack. So this study found that if you eat the constituents of a meal in a specific order, you can reduce the glucose spike of that meal by up to 75%. That's a lot. Meaning, yes, meaning you can eat the exact same meal, same quantity, same foods. Just by switching the order, you get a smaller spike. And you guessed it, the best thing to eat first is the vegetables, as I mentioned earlier, because you take advantage of the fiber. And then when you put the starches and sugars at the end of the meal, you get a much smaller spike than if you have them earlier on in the meal. And so we can think about this a little further and say, okay, when we want to eat something sweet, we should never eat it on an empty stomach. We should always have it after a meal as dessert. And that's one of the ways you can eat the chocolate you love or the cookie you love with less impact on your glucose levels. So always think dessert is the way to go. Again, common sense, that's when most people eat sweet foods. But now we tend to have sweet foods between meals in the morning, and that just leads to big spikes. So always have sweet foods at the end of a meal. And learn to use my hack so you can eat the carbs that you love in a way that leads to smaller spikes. And last thing I will add is that when you start using the hacks and reducing your glucose spikes, you actually crave junk food and starches and sugars way less. So sort of naturally, you go towards a state where you're eating fewer carbs 
anyway. But if you try to go the brute force route and say, okay, tomorrow I'm going keto, that's very difficult to maintain. And most people just can't do it for more than a couple of days, right? But if you solve the underlying issue, you're going to be able to build this into a lifestyle. Did you have a moment where you realized that you were going to do this? You mean talk about yeah. blood sugar all day? Uh, yes. <laughs> Did you just have this, uh, you know, you, you and I, this is pretty funny because I feel like all I do is talk about protein and muscle. Yeah, I know. It's so funny. Um, did I have a moment? I had several moments, but it sort of built up. I think the aha moment was when I saw that depersonalization correlating with these big glucose spikes. That was my personal aha moment. And then when I was working in Silicon Valley and I started getting super interested about this topic, I thought, why is nobody made glucose super mainstream and almost, you know, at one with pop culture. And over time, as I built the Instagram and I, I felt that there was traction, um, it built in myself too, and it became a passion. And then the book happened and, you, you know, things just sort of snowball. There was not a moment where I thought this is what I'm going to do with my life. It sort of happened over time. What about you? How long have you been doing that? Five years. And it just, it took a life of its own. Totally, totally. But I do think the universe always wanted me to talk about this topic because when I was 11 years old, we had a theater production in my school and uh, I was the pancreas. And I was talking in this little, I know, I was talking. In, <laughs> and so my role was to play the pancreas, the organ um, that manages glucose levels. So if I look back, I'm like, oh, okay, the universe always wanted me to talk about glucose. It, it was written. How did you figure out how to make it mainstream? I think this is the big struggle that a lot of people, scientists do have. I mean, you've been able to simplify it. And listen, you guys that are listening, whether you're providers, it you do have to sacrifice nuance to make information accessible. And that is just the reality of it. People may disagree, but again, to actually help the masses, the simpler, quite frankly, the better. And you sacrifice, again, some of those the nuances. It, it just happens. Absolutely. And you say the simpler, the better. I got to a point where my content was so simple that I could remove all the words from it and people would still understand it because I went to drawings, right? My, my genius moment was to dream up these images of glucose spikes side by side, explaining a simple concept. So for example, broccoli and then mac and cheese, smaller spike than mac and cheese alone. I don't even have to write broccoli and mac and cheese because there's a little image of them right? I stripped things down so far that I almost can't take anything away anymore. So I think creating that visual graph was the thing that propulsed this content and this science to the level of mainstream. I think it's all about the visual element. It was, it's brilliant. It's brilliant. It's straightforward and it Thank can you. reach a lot of people. And even yes. on that note, I am sure that you've been thinking about other things. Because at this point now, you've been talking about glucose for five years and you're probably thinking to yourself, wow, everybody just wants to talk about glucose. And I'm so over talking about glucose. But it has now just hit mainstream. Has that happened to you? Yeah. Yeah, you know, two years in is when I felt like I cannot talk about glucose anymore. I just cannot say what glucose is. And then something switched in my brain where, I don't know, it didn't feel frustrating anymore. It just became automatic. So when you ask me, what is glucose? There's no part of me that's resisting like, oh my God, I've answered this question a million times. I'm like, I'm very happy to tell you the answer that I think is the best answer and, and is going to convey this information to, to the person. But yes, of course, you know, I'm thinking about evolving things. I'm really interested in mental health because that's the reason I got into this in the first place. So I always wonder, could I do to mental health what I did to glucose? So could I make it a visual? Could I turn complicated science into easy hacks? Could I make it super human and accessible? But I think that's going to take me, you know, decades to get there because we don't have a good way to visualize mental health. And I don't think that I can create a message that is 
super mass market if I don't have a visual support. So I've been talking to a few companies that map the brain, the voltage, et cetera, but it's too early. I don't think we can really extract from that a simple visual image that could help me uh, in that journey. But I'm curious your thoughts about that. I think you'll probably have yeah. a, a flash of insight moment because really it was this ebb and flow of these moods or anxiety that led you to really pinpoint glucose. And again, I yeah. hear that a lot from my patients when they're feeling a certain way. We have to figure out, is it actually anxiety or is it blood sugar dysregulation? And oftentimes, if they're waking up in the middle of the night, we'll see uh, ebbs and flows in their blood sugar that make them feel extremely anxious. So do I think that you'll be able to do it? I do. I absolutely do. And again, you are a very unique blend of being interested in the biochemistry, but also interested in this idea of bringing things to mass market in the mainstream. That's unusual. So my yeah. question is, what did you do in Silicon Valley? I was working, okay, so I'll back up. Right before Silicon Valley, I was doing my master's degree in biochemistry at Georgetown. And I did not like the lab. Like it was it was too slow for me. I was like six months to do this experiment. And like, then something no. can go wrong. I, you know, and then there's this technicality like, and then you have to scrap the whole thing. And it's seven years later and your paper doesn't get published. I mean, really, oh, it was, it did not work your eyes my out personality. Out <laughs> Pretty much. So, so from that moment, I knew I, I wouldn't be in academia. And in Silicon Valley, I really wanted to work at this company called 23andMe. They do genetic testing and ancestry, et cetera. And I thought it was the coolest thing. And I wanted to work on the product team. I said, hey, guys, so I have a master's in biochemistry, but I want to work on product. That means I want to work on the website and the emails and the experience and the features because that's my true passion. Like I'm a user obsessed person. I always think about what is going to be the experience of somebody who has no scientific backing. I always think about like my mother, my grandmother, my aunt, how are they going to interact with this piece of information? How do I make it seamless and super simple? So I, they finally gave me an internship after I begged them for an internship for about six months, uh, kicking and screaming. They were like, fine, you can, you can work here for three months during the summer. And that's when I learned engineering and design and software and you know, I blossomed. I loved it. And then when I had the moment of, oh, wow, glucose is going to be important to me, I merged the two. I merged my love of science and my understanding of scientific studies with my passion for making user-centric products, essentially, and design and marketing and brrr, made a little snowball and voila, Glucose Goddess was born. It's amazing. It's extraordinary. It, you guys have to check out our stuff. It the extraordinary part about it is the information does bring awareness to blood sugar regulation. And one could say, well, does blood sugar regulation and checking it, does, you know, what are those long term outcomes if you're healthy? Maybe not much. But if you have dysregulated blood sugar, ebbs and flows are likely not good. Insulin should be thought of as a fail safe mechanism, not something that you're calling upon frequently. And then what else is so interesting about what Jessie has done is she's taken these somewhat complex topics and made it available to everybody. And rather than we could have gone in, down the rabbit hole of the acetic acid and what is the structure and what enzymes are it inhibiting, et cetera, et cetera. But that might be interesting for her and I, and maybe you. But the point is, is when people are sitting there just learning, they just want to do the thing. And that's amazing. Thank you to First Form for sponsoring this episode of the show. With all this discussion on blood sugar regulation, I am going to share with you one of my on-the-go, keep my blood sugar stable snacks that is balanced with carbohydrates and protein, and that is the Level 1 Protein Bar they come in all different kinds of flavors, chocolate chip cookie dough, chocolate mint cookie. One of our favorites is chocolate peanut butter pretzel. Yes, you heard that correctly. And what I love about the level one bar is number one, it has whey protein in it. It has a one-to-one -one or close to one-to-one -one ratio of carbohydrates to protein that helps with blood sugar stability. 
They taste amazing. You almost think that you are eating a candy bar, but you're not. So if you are looking for a sweet snack or potentially even a lower calorie meal, then level one bars are the way to go. Get yours at firstform.com slash Dr. Lion. That's firstform.com slash Dr. Lion. It's all about just starting and doing one thing. And can I ask you, uh, Gabrielle, you talking about, you know, am I bored of talking about glucose? What about you? Because you become the protein princess or, you know, you, there's a whole thing around you and muscle. And I'm sure that you're thinking about other things as well. Quite frankly, I am. I'm going to go back to take a position and be part-time faculty and study sexual medicine and hormones and do research looking actually at the hormonal interface of hormones and muscle mass. Just part-time. I've got two more books to write. And then of course the podcast. Thank you so much for asking. But I, what I do believe that it's important is if you are talking about something that you have to be continuously educated about it. And that's what this podcast is all about, these transparent conversations. And I believe that the next frontier is going to be this idea of sexual medicine and hormonal replacement in a way that is different than it's being discussed now. I cannot wait to learn from you and hear everything you're going to be sharing. That's very exciting. Muscle is just one part of it. It's the pinnacle just for you as if glucose is this major piece. Muscle is a huge piece and protein is a huge piece of that. But there are so many other concepts that ride along with muscle-centric medicine and overall health, like sexual health, like hormonal health. And I'm so excited to be able to talk about some of these other things. What is next for you? I mean, you are all over the place. And you know what else I'm really, what I, else I really, really love? So the pictures are great, but the fashion is even better. Girl. <laughs> we'll save that for the online, for the offline chat. We'll WhatsApp app, but the, the fashion, my friend. Thank you. I appreciate it. I'm obsessed with fashion. I mean, I'm trying to, you know, be the first scientist biochemist who's, you know, really in the fashion game. And I, it's again, just weird parts of my brain coming together. And I'm like, how can I merge these two? How can science and fashion become one? And it's my little personal challenge right now. So I just launched this YouTube show with sort of in-depth um, episodes where I cover all these topics. And let me tell you, every single one of those episodes has a full look that is really awesome from different fashion brands that I've been working with. So yeah, love the fashion, love the fashion. And also I'm a Gemini, right? And so I think I love this idea of contrast. How do you bring two things that have nothing to do together and make a little UFO, like a unique little thing that nobody has ever done before? And I think that's where a lot of genius lies. So if you're listening and you're somebody who has two very distinct interests, how could you bring them together? Because that makes something that is so unique, right? I love it. Well, Jesse, Thank it's you. so wonderful to have you on the podcast. We'll link to all your things and you and I will catch up offline about all things glucose and fashion. Amazing. Amazing. Thank you so much for having me.